How happy is the blameless vessel's lot? The world forgetting by the world forgot. Eternal sunshine of a spotless mind. Each prayer accepted and each wish resigned. Is there any risk of brain damage? Well, uh, technically speaking, the procedure is brain damage, but it's, it's on a par with a night of heavy drinking. Nothing you'll miss. What won't I miss? It's time for a little something. I forget. My notes say I'm Professor Robert E.G. Black, and I am here with Eric Deutsch from Flash Gordon Minute, and it's time to discuss eternal sunshine of the spotless mind. Hello. I think I'm on the planet Mongo. I'm not entirely sure. I just, it's, it's, everything's this hazy. This is news to me. Yeah, it's hazy. Yeah, they're erasing me. So I have no memory of this and we're on Mongo. Yeah, yeah. Okay. I, I guess you're the host of the show. Thanks for having me. Sure. Uh, uh, you'll save every one of us, right? Absolutely. Anyway, we're on Columbia campus. We're at the Barnes and Noble and Joel is looking sad. He will continue to look sad through most of the film. <laughs> what do you expect from a comedian? Was this kind of the beginning of his becoming serious phase? This was a couple films in because okay. Cable Guy was kind of a transition where he was doing creepy funny. Mm -hmm. And I think Man in the Moon was before this. But again, playing a comedian, though. So, right. Yeah. So it was right at near the beginning. And the way it was advertised, you wouldn't know it. The movie seems like a fun little romp that's exciting and happy, which parts of it are. This is not it. <laughs> this is him finding out that his girlfriend is acting like she doesn't even know who he is, as Patrick calls her Clamato, <laughs> which, <laughs> no. Even if Clamato didn't exist, Clamato is just a bad nickname. Yeah, it's uh, there is a certain VD that it sounds a little too much like. Plus, timing wise, it doesn't work. Patrick is trying to steal everything from Joel's relationship with Clem, but her hair was orange when she and Joel broke up and she just changed it to blue, which means it has never been red while she's known Patrick. Ah, maybe she has spoken to him about thinking of changing her hair color to that. And so he went with it. Well, he would know she had red hair before. Okay. From the notes, but okay. Like, yeah. Well, why would you call someone Clamato? It's not a good nickname <laughs> unless their hair is bright red, <laughs> which it is not. She turns to the side and kind of ignores Joel. And the camera also just stays where she was because we're not supposed to see what he's not supposed to see is he can't see Patrick. Yeah. Very well done there with his face hidden behind all the stuff on the counter. Uh-huh. Stuff on the counter being a vault guide to book display. It's a college library. It makes sense. Mm. So why doesn't he cause a scene? I mean, why does he not press her on how she reacts to him if she doesn't know him? You know, he's obviously hurt. And so is he just like, uh, yeah, I, I don't, don't do know. This in public or, I mean, I, I feel like to hell with being in public. If your long-term ex-girlfriend is literally acting as if she has no idea who you are, not that she, you know, she's not being mean to him. She's not giving him the evil eye. She's not saying, you know, please leave anything like that. Right. He's literally acting as if she has no idea who he is. Mm -hmm. And he just, you know, sort of, oh, okay. And then turns around and leaves. Yeah. He doesn't even say anything to her. He's not like, Clem, what are you doing? You know? No. Something basic. Instead, he walks away. But also, it's possible he did. We haven't seen much of the memories being erased so far. Ah. But what we have seen is where in the original scene, he had walked away from Frank in the lobby. In the new version, he Frank was the one leaving. He walked out of the memory a different way. It might be him walking out of the memory as part of the like process. Okay. And it is part of their transition for the scenes. So perhaps he did cause a scene and he just, he does not remember it anymore. Right. It doesn't connect right anymore because the memories are funky, mm. basically. Just like how he left Rob and Carrie's house a moment ago, I think it was just last minute, was he started to talk about buying Clem a gift. And it transitioned to the buying of the gift mm -hmm. as he's talking because the memories are hooked into each other. So this one, maybe he just didn't say anything else about what he did to Rob and Carrie. So the one memory is taking over the other as they both get erased. I buy it. <laughs> I just made that up. It makes sense in a way. 
she rolls over and just starts kissing Patrick after calling him baby boy. That's her nickname for him. Can I call out something here? Kate Winslet's yeah. one of my favorite actresses. I hate the way she pronounces the word baby in this scene. I mean, obviously it's her character, but just like that baby, it just, it really runs me the wrong way. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. The way she says it, I can't tell if she thinks giving him a nickname is bad or if it's something with the way that Kate Winslet is pronouncing it, that it comes out weird. It almost sounded to me like Patrick decided what his nickname was going to be. <laughs> he told her, call me baby boy. Yeah. <laughs> and she just, she's doing it. But I mean, they got together. I don't know if we ever find out exactly when Clem got them erased, but they seem to mail out their things pretty fast. So, yeah, they're weird. <laughs> they're a weird couple. And it'll just get weirder as the film goes. But we get the fun transition, which I believe I couldn't find where I had learned this, but I believe it was done entirely practical. Hmm. The set for Carrie and Rob's house was in the back room of the bookstore. Well, then that's very well done. Because mm-hmm. it's not even a complete set. It's basically there's some stairs and they put a piano in front of it. Yeah. And there's some books. And then for the reverse angle, it might be a completely different room. As he's walking out, the lights go out behind him kind of haphazardly in the bookstore and it disappears. And he ends up at the bottom of the stairs with his hands on the gift from before. So that's where he is telling this story. So maybe it's just he couldn't talk about. Maybe there was a fight and he couldn't talk any further in this moment. So we don't see it in this moment. Yeah, possibly. Or he's the kind of person who shuts down. Yeah. I mean, he's acting. I feel like if there had been a fight, he's acting too depressed, I think, for there to have been a fight. Like, maybe, I feel like yeah. if there was a fight, he'd be a little more animated and agitated, you know? He's acting much more just like a defeated man who just turned around and walked away. Right. As she's doing cute talk with Patrick. Yeah, right. What are you doing here, baby? Just came to surprise you. Which she did turn again to Joel before he walked away. Let me know if you need something, sir. Which was nice. (laughs) But then went back to kissing Patrick again. Right. As Joel has walked away, Patrick's like, how are you? She says, pretty good, pretty bored, pretty tired. And I swear, I don't know if this is what she says, but the transcript had it as her saying to Patrick, I so want what's in your suit. Yeah, I saw that. And I'm like, I don't know if that's what she says, but I don't know what that means. I, I mean, I'm sort of assuming she means uh, a certain <laughs> specific part of the suit that might be in the lower abdominal region. Is he even <laughs> wearing a suit? <laughs> well, we don't know because we can't even see him. But maybe it's just a, her figure of speech, maybe. Yeah. We will see his outfit later because mm. it's that moment that he tries to turn his head around. I believe that's the same scene because he's back in a memory they've already erased. So there are books. I tried to see if they meant anything. They don't seem to mean anything. They're just random books they pulled the covers off of. There's a piano by the stairs. Joel sits down and he's talking. Why? Why would you do that to me? We cut to Rob. He's sitting there with a dog in his lap now for some reason. (laughs) And he exchanges a glance with, we cut to Carrie. There's something going on. They know something. Mm. And Joel is behind her. And I love that he keeps his hand on the gift, even when he sits down. Because his hand is stuck there. Let me go back to Rob, who says, hey, does anybody want a joint? (laughs) You know, Carrie yells at him. But honestly... To me, yeah. that seems like the best thing at that moment, help. to be honest with you. Like, I, <laughs> yes, I absolutely do. <laughs> What's even funnier is something I didn't notice in a moment because she says, oh, God, Rob, give it a rest. She gets up and I thought she was going to go comfort Joel. I've seen this movie multiple times. And in this moment, I'm like, oh, she's going to go comfort him. No, she touches him on the shoulder and walks past him up the stairs. Not only does she touch him on the shoulder and walk past, but she says, I know it's horrible. And she says it in such an incredibly unemotional. I know it's horrible. Like she just, I don't care. I'm out of (laughs) here. Yep. I know. For being honest. It's horrible. And she's his sister. (laughs) So that's not very nice. I know. I haven't seen this movie. I only saw this movie once and it was a long time ago. I did did not rewatch it. So Mm, yeah, I don't know the answer to this question, which is why I'm asking it. Okay. Do they know that she has had her memories wiped? So they know sh- that's why she. Yes. Asked. They are about to reveal that to him because they have ah, the postcard from Lacuna. Okay. Got it. Okay. That's where this scene is going. Then that explains the look between the two of them. And that explains why she's acting that way because she's just like, oh, crap. Now, as his sister, I now have to deal with all this mm-hmm. because I know about this and, and I have to now somehow navigate this without revealing it to him. Okay. Th- that, that makes much more sense. Okay. It's kind of weird that Lacuna doesn't send Joel a postcard. 
could she have requested he not get one? I assume, but I feel like there's a problem. We've gotten into this in so many episodes of this show already. Their business model is weird. They spend a lot on postage. They can't bill people for these procedures. So I don't know where they're getting money. (laughs) Then they send postcards out to like everyone, you know, letting them know that you had someone else erased. And then they don't send a postcard to that person because I guess you tell them, yeah, don't send that. But also you don't know you erased them. So you're just going to end up cycling like Joel and Clementine will. I feel like this procedure only would work in reality if you know you had something erased because you have to know why things feel weird. But if you know you had something erased, now some people would trust themselves to say, okay, obviously I had a good reason for having this erased. I'm going to go on my life. But there are some personalities who would say, I have to know. Mm -hmm. I have to know what I erased. I have to know why I erased it. And I don't know what mechanisms might be in place to recoup those, you know, I guess you could go to your friends and say, please just tell me what it was. And you have to, you know, trust that your friends are telling the truth. But there's definitely going to be people who are going to want to reverse the erasing. You'd have to almost like the last thing you do before they erase. The big thing they need to erase is the emotion, not really the memory. But their explanation is those go hand in hand. Fine. Whatever. We accept your premises. You need like a letter that you wrote to yourself Hmm. explaining here's what I did. Here's why. But minimal information so that like you can you have to convince yourself not to be curious. And also, if this works, it won't matter if you're curious. Right. Unless you immediately go after that same person. But if they got a postcard saying you erase them, I'm thinking that relationship isn't going to jump right back in. <laughs> yeah. I mean, if, if I get a postcard that an ex-girlfriend had me erased for her memory, that I mean, mm-hmm. that just being with me was so damaging to her <laughs> that she didn't even want to remember she even knew that we ever knew each other. Right. I think I would just steer clear. <laughs> and you can't yeah. confront them about it. If you go and have a confrontation, it won't get you anything because they don't remember you. Right. So it'd be pointless. It puts a big problem in the middle of the relationship going back. So I think it, I think it could work. Not that we can erase memories or anything, as far as I know, as far as I can remember. Ooh. <laughs> this is oh god, she's punishing me, and that's when Carrie says, "Walk past." She says, "I know, honey, it's horrible." <laughs> he says, "For being honest, I should just go to her house." And that's when Rob jumps in and says, "No, no, no, no. <laughs> yeah. You don't want to go no, there, man. Do not go there. No, no, no." And he's interrupted because the dog rather abruptly decides to leave. And I've never actually found behind the scenes stuff on this, but I assume that just happened. And because he's, you know, a comedian, he was able to play it off. Mm. And he's like, he makes it funny where he's telling the dog to go, even though the dog clearly just didn't want to be there. Yeah. I mean, sometimes my cat, like I'll uh, call him over as cats are prone to do instead of him coming to me, he'll turn around and walk completely opposite direction. Uh-huh. So yeah. I'll just be like, ah, you, you know, and I'll wave like, oh, whatever. One of our cats will walk down the stairs across the living room over to me and then just out of arm's reach, just lay down. Oh, I get that all the time. (laughs) After I call it, I'm like, why did you come? Why are you here? So this dog was just in the scene. I don't think the dog's in the script. It's just there. (laughs) Just random. (laughs) Dog leaves and he, it's funny because it interrupts. And thus minute 24 ends. Anything more to say about the minute Uh, or memory? No, I I can't remember anything else to say about this minute. (laughs) I keep pretending I'm going to make a question like at the end of the episode is like, what would you want to have erased? But we've already decided many times on this show, no one wants to actually erase anything because it's problematic. There are things that I definitely would erase, but like nothing that I would want (laughs) to talk about publicly. (laughs) (laughs) Fair, same. (laughs) My general thing is, I wouldn't want to erase anything that was too long ago Mm. because even horrible things when they're that long ago have influenced so many other things. I need to know they're there. Mm, Yeah, that's a good point. It's the whole thing of like, you know, if you went back and, you know, like the big decisions in your life, oh, if I had gone to this college instead of that college, oh, but it's like, but then everything else after that point, it's a completely different life. Mm -hmm. You can't possibly think about it because you're living a completely different life. Yeah. That's one of the things I, I would play that out in the Groundhog Day Project blog a few times where I'm like, if I had made this choice back in the 90s and like hadn't dropped out of school, 
I wouldn't have had weird office jobs later in the decade, maybe, but that means I wouldn't have met my wife and I wouldn't have, we wouldn't have kids right. wouldn't be, and all these other things that wouldn't happen. And sometimes I imagine the idea of doing like a, not an erasure, but like a, um, it's a wonderful life kind of scenario mm-hmm. where you get to have a glimpse of what that other universe is like. If I had stuck out college the first time, would I still be mostly the same person I am right now, just with a few changes, like a different job? Or would that have changed the trajectory of everything I was interested in and right. the way I approach everything? Am I the host of Star Wars Minute instead of this? <laughs> Does my podcast have an audience? <laughs> we can dream. <laughs> but ultimately, those scenarios uh, don't. I think the more I talk about them, the more I come to realize that some of these fantastical ideas wouldn't be worth actually exploring unless I knew that I could also undo them, which kind of misses the point. Yeah. I mean, that's the thing, you know, it's like probably for me, one of the biggest decisions in my life was choosing to go to University of Wisconsin instead of University of Maryland. Mm. Well, if I had chosen to go to University of Maryland, I mean, it's an entirely different part of the country. Yeah. So obviously that's just, you know, my first job is not the same first job. The second job is not the same second job. You know, it's, it's just, you're not, it's a completely different setup. Different friends. You know, yeah. Everything is completely different. Where do I different end up? Relationships. Yeah, exactly. And so then you fall down that road and say, well, if that happens, the odds of me meeting my wife are very slim. And the odds, therefore, of having my kids is, is very slim. And it's just like, I don't really want to think about the other life because then I don't have my wife and kids. There's obviously a different wife and kids, so, you know, in that life, but right. I don't want the different wife and kids. I'm happy with my actual wife and kids. Yeah. It's that moment in about time where he finds out that if he time travels too far back, it disrupts literally who his child is. Mm. His child was made by a different sperm and became a different child. And so he comes back and finds a different kid, but he can still remember the first one. Mm -hmm. And even if he gets the memory of both, he still will forever have that kid that he lost. So it's, well, all three of these are tragic. There are different levels of tragedy and comedy and sci-fi and fantasy. That's why I love them together. What shows have you had? I have had two shows that do not nearly get into the deep existential thoughts that these do. <laughs> We've got Flash Gordon Minute, which is all about goofy action and crazy bright colors and barely veiled innuendos. <laughs> and we got Escape from New York Minute, which certainly has a lot of pensive moments on the screen as Snake Plissken walks around thinking about the horrible situation he's been tricked into. So I guess maybe get a little existential there. <laughs> but again, ultimately, he's, he just wants to get those uh, capsules dissolved in his neck, though. Yep. Those two podcasts are on all your favorite podcatchers. They're both complete, so you can binge them both. And Robert was a guest on both of them as well. Yes, I was. Thank you for listening. Eternal Sunshine of the Spotless Minute is just one part of an existential trilogy of podcasts. Tune in every Tuesday for Minutia Ex Machina, every Wednesday for the Groundhog Day Project Minute by Minute, and every Thursday for more Eternal Sunshine. And you can follow all three shows on one feed. Just search An Existential Trilogy. Follow this show on Twitter, Instagram, or Facebook at Spotless Minute. This has been a production of Lemming Drops Studio. You can find links to more at lemmingdrops.com or join the Facebook group Lemming Drops Studio Tour. Also, you can support all my shows at patreon.com slash lemmingdrops. Until next time. This is it, Joel. Oh, God. He's gonna be gone soon. Okay, what's up? I know. What do we do? Look, we're going off. Can you hear me? I don't want this anymore. I want to go.